All right, welcome to Christian Overcomers, and thank you for joining us for this Bible study. Revelation 6c, great and fearful signs from heaven. You know, ever since Christ walked the earth, Christians have always had two questions on their mind. And that is, when is, going, when is the end going to be? And what signs are going to let us know that we're near? And um, that's how we're going to kind of look at these seals, trumpets, and vials as we get through them. We want to ask ourselves those two questions. When is it going to happen? And what specific things are going to transpire when a seal is opened? When a trumpet blows? When a vial is poured out? And uh, we're going to have some fun with it. And... Uh, but let's open up in prayer and ask for wisdom and understanding first. Heavenly Father, we just pray for, for understanding as we study these seals, trumpets, and vials. We pray that you can open our eyes, open our ears, and help us answer those questions of when are they going to happen as far as chronological order and what is going to be happening during each event. Um, because we know that you would have us, you would like us to know that because it's in your word. In Yeshua, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We're going to do a little overview so far of what we're talking about here. We're taking a look at the seals, trumpets, and vials of Revelation. The, I, I believe that the seals, trumpets, and vials happen in chronological order of each other. And throughout this series of studies, I'm going to show you different reasons why. And I think the case is pretty solid. In fact, I think it's indisputable. At, at least for sure for the trumpets and the vials. But I think the, the seals as well, as I had mentioned in a prior study. But So we'll take a look at this. Seals happen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then in the, when the seventh seal is opened... We move up to the trumpets, the first trumpet blows. Then it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then when the seventh trumpet blows, the vials begin to be poured out. And they go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we are to the end. The, the time when uh, I believe one of the angels is going to stand up there and say, it is finished. Or a voice comes out of the temple after the last vials poured out. Um, so that's a little overview of what we're looking at here. I think it's pretty simple. Hey, if you can count to seven, God's got to divide it up the way it's supposed to be. Um, they don't jump around. The, the seals, trumpets, and vials do not line up with each other as far as um, the, second trump or the second seal, the second trump, and the second vial. They don't line up. They're not the same event. They are distinctly different events Hap all happening at different times. That's important. Because um, God's just not telling us the same things in a different way. He wants us to know that there are uh, many different events we are to look forward to. Um, well, we look forward to them because they're going, most of them are going to be judgments that are poured out upon our enemies. But the enemy's not going to like it too well. So we go to... Um, well, let's break down the seven seals since we're here. Seven seals of Revelation. The first seal, we saw that the new world order begins its conquest. And the verses there in Revelation and Ma Revelation 6 and Matthew 24, they're also written about in Luke 21, uh, Mark 13. And there's also different Old Testament uh, scriptures that foretell of these exact same events. So... Um, I'm just giving you a couple examples, a couple of different verses here. This is by no means an exhaustive uh, uh, bunch of verses here. So we go to the second seal, and it says, uh, World wars break down the current order, divide and conquer strategy. The third seal opens, and we see the rider on the black horse, which uh, um, symbolized economic manipulation. And the fourth seal, a fourth of the world suffers war, famine, and pestilence. And number five, the martyrs cry out for vengeance in the fifth seal. And in the sixth seal that we're going to get today, we're going to see fearful sights from heaven. And then in the seventh seal, 
we got the seven trumpets begin blowing. Uh, but I, I want you to um, use these charts, these tables, these timelines that we give you, and use them as um, something to build off of. Um, I don't want uh, you to get it etched in stone that these uh, charts or graphs are perfect. Um, because there may, I'm, you know, I may make an error and I may have to change it and refine it later on. That's, it's just the way it is. This is prophecy. Just like Daniel, when he was shown different visions, he said he, I mean, he was disturbed at some of them because he didn't understand. And he kept, he prayed for understanding. And then in that same book, it says that many shall run to and fro, the book of Daniel, and knowledge shall be increased. Knowledge should never stay the same. It doesn't end with one particular denomination, one particular teacher. It continually builds. It's the Holy Spirit that reveals to us knowledge and wisdom. It's not our own intellect, although we have to use our brain, we have to study, we have to try hard to figure things out. But ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit that opens things up in due time that perhaps other people could not see in the past. That's just the way it goes. Um, so let's take a, we're going to, today obviously, we're going to get into the sixth seal and that's what we're going to focus on. You see that happens right after that happens, the seventh seal opens, then we move into the trumpet. So we're almost there. We're getting to the end of that. Um, let us open to Revelation chapter six, verse 12, and it reads, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. That is pretty, uh, that is pretty fascinating. You know, what are we looking at here? The sun turns dark as sackcloth of hair, and the moon turns into blood? Well, it just so happens that over the next two years, we, we, we've already begun it. It just began uh, about a month or two months ago at Passover, a series of blood red moons that fall. Blood red moons are um, uh, total lunar eclipses. During a total lunar eclipse, the moon turns blood, it turns blood red. That's what it does. It doesn't turn completely dark. It just goes uh, blood red with the reflection of the sun there. So over the next two years here in 2014 and 2015, like I said, we have blood red moons on the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, says Sukkot there. That's the Feast of Tabernacles and Passover. Now that is an interesting uh, coincidence, is it not? I think it's probably a sign. And then it, within those signs, we even see a, the sun turning completely dark total solar eclipse, and you know when that happens? It happens on the biblical new year. The biblical new year. The, when I say biblical new year, I mean the, uh, uh, the solely lunar calendar. Months begin each moon. I mean, it's that simple. You look up in the sky and you see from moon to moon to moon. That's a new month. That's God's little reflector up there to t help us tell time, to keep track of time. And um, that's, therefore, when we see these signs, you notice you, you never can see um, these um, signs unless there is a full moon or a new moon. That's the only time a solar or a lunar eclipse can happen. Solar eclipses happen on new moons. And um, that's when the moon is dark and the moon goes in front of the sun and we don't see the light of the moon, or a uh, full moon, um, that's when the blood red moons happen, lunar eclipses. So that, that's, you just see kind of, this is God's time clock working here. And then on, when we look over here, we see Rosh Hashanah, that is the Feast of Trumpets, approximately one third, now check that out, one third of the sun is darkened out. That's next 2015, year 2015, on the Feast of Tabernacles. You, what is significant about that? Well, one third 
is mentioned throughout the trumpets of Revelation. And we see right before the trumpets of Revelation are mentioned and during, we see different astronomical or great and fearful sights from heaven. So is this a sign that the blood red moon and the and the and the sun turn into sackcloth is coming um, de facto or that specific sign? It is possible. It is possible. God always gives us signs before the the real event. Now I want to show something here. Look back at this verse. It says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. Now check this out. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. So what I want you to look at there is that in conjunction with this blood red moon, and the uh, it looks like this is all happening at the same time, and the sun turning black, you have this great earthquake. So what does that mean? Does, has this event happened in the past? Um, is it happening now? Well, I don't think so because I don't think we would miss it. We would have this great earthquake happening at the same time to let us know. And, and you know what, Joel, I don't think we'll get there today, but Joel chapter 2 and 3 mention this same event. Mention this same event. Uh, you might want to make a study of that. It's very fascinating. Okay, we'll go to verse 13. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. What is this talking about here? Stars falling from, earth, uh, falling from heaven to the earth. Well, you know, we're not talking about literal star, like a whole star falling and hitting the earth. That would blow up the earth. I mean, the sun is, I don't know how many times bigger than the earth. It would just consume the earth. But you know what? There are things that are called falling stars, shooting stars, and they're fragments of meteors, comets, and so on. I mean, if you look at a meteor shower, you, you see that same thing. They look like falling stars. I mean, if you weren't, uh, if we weren't so advanced today with our technology, I mean, to the naked eye, what what is a meteor shower? It's a star falling from heaven to the earth. But I, I don't think this is any old. This isn't just some regular meteor shower. Um, this is probably something that is just spectacular like has never been seen before. I mean, imagine looking up at the sky and seeing all these fireballs coming down. Uh, I think there was times in the past, I can't remember, but I remember doing research for this uh, years back. And uh, back in, I don't know if it was the 1700s, 1600s, but they, they described different, some of these meteor showers that were just um, um, amazing. Nothing like we've seen yet. Um, so here we see a picture of it, a little, uh, to give you an idea of it. There we go. Shooting stars. Now, some people look at this, those shooting, those stars falling from heaven to the earth as being some spiritual event. Um, you know, I'm going to keep my mind open. I'm not going to, you know, set it in stone, but I, I it's, to me, it, it, it sort of can be easily ruled out that these stars falling from heaven to the earth are not some spiritual event because of what's going to happen in the, in, the subsequent, in the next verses here. We're going to see the effect of what this caused people to do. And besides that, you know, I'm not knocking spiritual interpretations of things. Some things definitely we are supposed to, you know, get a spiritual lesson from, like the tabernacle and things like that. Um... But also, you can, you can go too far and you can spiritualize the whole book of Revelation away. And we must not do that because a lot of this stuff in Revelation, I mean, what we're looking at in the seals, trumpets, and vials is Egypt happening all over again, the ten plagues of Egypt, but on a much greater scale. Because God wants to show the world His power. His might. He wants the world to know that He is God. 
And how does he do that to the spiritually blind? Well, he's got to use physical things. Physical signs. And we'll document that here in these verses as well as we're going to, if we have time, we'll go to Luke 21. Take a look at some of them there. So what I'm saying is many of these things in the seals, trumpets, and vials end up being physical things, especially when we're looking at the trumpets and the vials. Anyways, and the heaven departed as a scroll, verse 14, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every island or every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Man, what is that talking about? I mean, you're talking about the heaven departing as a scroll? Excuse me, then every island and um, every mountain and island, like every continent and every little island shifting or moving? We're looking forward to a great shaking. And you know what? There has been great shakings before. You just look at the earth. Um, scientists believe that the crust of the earth is the equivalent of like an eggshell on an egg. Uh, around an egg yolk and that it's just that thin you know so I mean if God wants to move things he can move things he can move things um, in the first earth age there were many cataclysmic um, overthrows and destructions there were a lot of things that happened on this earth and you can see the scars of it I wish I had some pictures but you know all, all one has to do is go out to like um <clears throat> go see Meteor Crater down in Arizona or is it uh, New Mexico? I think it's Arizona. Uh, Winslow, Arizona, I think. Or um, go out to the Petrified Forest and you see these great trees that used to be out, uh, you know, this is out in the desert. A place that used to be a lush forest turned into a desert by a great shaking, by an instant change. So that's what this is, what we're talking about here. This is, this is an instant change. <clears throat> um, you know, when I looked at this before, and I'm not going to argue with somebody if they, if, if they believe this, if they believe it this way, but one of the reasons I thought that the seals must have been an overview of the, uh, all the events that happened in the trumpets and the vials is because of this verse right here. It almost seemed as though this was, this was the very end, when everything gets changed, everything moves. So that's what I looked at as, as an outline. But I'm going to show today why I don't think that's the case. I think this is one of the, one, one of the initial fearful sights and great signs that will be seen from heaven, and there will be, there will be many more after this. But this is the indicator here, the sixth seal. And um, there we go. All right, here's a couple pictures here, heaven uh, being rolled up like a scroll. And there's a scroll, if you're wondering what that was. All right, let's go to verse 15. And the kings of the earth and the rich men and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Okay, so that's what I'm, that's why I'm saying this is a physical event happening here uh, to non-believers, non-believers, people who um, sinners, sinners, unrepentant sinners. Because what are they doing here now? They're not repenting. They're going to hide. They're going to hide. So this isn't some. This, this uh, seal opening here isn't some spiritual deception. This is a physical calamity. Frightening all of the people of the earth. I mean, they're, they're in survival mode here right now. And, um, you know, it's interesting that there are many videos on YouTube, some phony, some fake, but there's probably some truth to it that the elite are building underground bunkers in case of a cataclysmic event, such as a meteor impact, a comet flyby, and so forth. And uh, th here's a picture. This is just Cheyenne Mountain here, but gives you an idea. Some people think that there are other things like this um, that we don't know about, that we don't know about. And I wouldn't doubt it. 
verse 16, and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, or not, not, not fall on us like kill us, but to cover us, protect us. Cover us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. See, no repentance there. No repentance there. Verse 17, For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Now this is another spot where I looked at it. I was like, well, it seems like everything else was in chronological order when you're looking at the seals. I mean, you have the four horsemen march out. Everything's in natural uh, sequence, as well as the fifth seal. But then you get to the sixth seal, and it's like, oh, it's almost like it's looking forward to the immediate end. And again, I don't think so. This is the beginning of the end, right here. Uh, and what I believe, you see here, it says, for the great day of his wrath has come. Now, this is the beginning, I believe. I believe what this is saying here is the great day of his wrath has begun. And that period, uh, we don't know exactly how long the day of the Lord is. It's however long he pours out his judgments. We know the end times are, um, is specified as a seven-year period in Daniel, at least the time that the Antichrist has to rule the earth, divided up into two um, three-and-a-half-year segments. So, you know what's interesting is we're not going to get to it today, but it says who is going to be able to stand. But well, you know what? When we get to the seventh chapter of Revelation, we're going to find out who gets to stand. And it's the 144,000 that are going to be sealed and protected from the wrath. You'll see that there. You'll see that there. Hey, when you, when you look at these seals, trumpets, and vials again as a physical thing, you, you stop wandering around aimlessly guessing. I mean... I tell you what, I've picked up commentary after commentary. Somebody says, well, the, the second seal happened back in 1542 and this and that happened. And the third seal happened when the Romans conquered this area. And, and um, this trumpet represents, this mountain falling into the sea represents deception. And um, sure, I mean, I guess you could use figurative language to teach different things like that. But the point is, is I believe this is a lot more simple than many, many make it out to be. Again, to simplify it, this is the 10, the, what we're seeing here in Revelation is like the 10 plagues of Egypt, but on a much grander scale. Pharaoh being the Antichrist. Uh, Moses and Aaron, a type of the two witnesses of Revelation 11. That will bring plagues, physical plagues and calamities upon the earth, thus causing the people of the earth, to hate them. To hate them. Hey, man, I tell you what, if somebody started just bringing plagues on the earth today, right now, and they start telling people to repent, and they start saying, this is going to happen tomorrow, do you, think, do you think people would like that? I don't think so. Um, all right, so let's recap the events of the sixth seal from Revelation 6. There was a great earthquake. The sun was darkened. The moon became blood. Stars fall to earth. Heaven rolled up like a scroll. Every mountain and island moved. And the people on the earth were filled with fear. Why? Because we're having great and fearful signs from heaven indicating to us that the day of the Lord the day of his wrath has begun. That period of time. You go. I, I did a study on it in the first chapter of Revelation. I think it's titled The Day of the Lord or something like that. Yeah, if you haven't done that, go back and do it. Because the day of the Lord is defined as any period of time in which God deals, deals out his judgments. Which is usually in the form of uh, the four sore judgments, wars, famines, pestilence, and so on. Hey, when you can remember, I think it was uh, when David sinned, God told him to pick something. I think he said, pick war or famine or pestilence. He gave him these choices. That's the way God deals with nations. It's the only thing that gets their attention. Oh, and... Uh, 
And I forgot to go to the last part of this slide. It says, the great day of his wrath has begun. All right, now we're going to take a look again. Did we go over this? I think we did. The seven seals of Revelation. Yeah, we went over this. And I am going to go through them really quick. And then we're going to go to Luke 21, verse 7. Now I know why I put that slide up there again. is because I had up there a lot of different verses referencing each um, seal from even Matthew 24. And I didn't put Luke and Mark on there because I just didn't have space to fill on that timeline. But we're going to go to Luke 21. And I think we got plenty of time here, so we're going to read through it. And line it up with the, the, not only the sixth seal, but all as well as the other seals. Um, Luke 21, verse 7. And uh, they asked him, they asked Jesus, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? There's that question again. And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not after them. Don't go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. These things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. In other words, the end is not happening. But what did he say here? He says, don't be scared when you see these things happen. Hey, we will see more. Like I said, I, I believe what's going to lead up, ultimately lead up to the new world order is either World War III or the threat, the real threat or possibility of World War III. And then the new world order comes into being. Uh, one comes promising peace and safety for all. And that one being the Antichrist. Verse 10, Then he said unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. That was the second seal. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilences. Now that, that's all part of uh, the famines and pestilences are part of the uh, fourth seal. And fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. That's how we know when we're looking at these things in Revelation, such as um, the sixth seal, when, when there's stars falling to the earth, or when we're looking at the trumpets of Revelation, that's how we know that these are physical things. It's just not figurative language explaining something, like deception or something like that. The people are, are already deceived. These things are coming upon the deceived. It's not sending more deception. This is the result of them being deceived. Now they're going to see fearful sights and great signs. Hey, this world is going to get into, it's going to get into turmoil. That's what Christ is saying. Before the new world order comes into being, the world is going to be is going to get into a state of instability. And that's why it's important that we as Christians prepare. Not just for the time when the Antichrist comes, but plan for before that. He says, he told us there's going to be turmoil in the world. He said, don't be afraid. But he didn't say, be careless and not plan. He didn't say, don't store up any food, guns, or ammunition. Because we should do that. So what is a fearful sight? It's when you look up and you go, oh, I don't want to even say the word, but you know what they're going to say. I can just see all the YouTube cameras on right now, all the people posting on YouTube. I can hear a lot of uh, four-letter words coming out of their mouths. Oh, man, did you see that? Oh. And uh, when the Antichrist gets here, he'll probably blame it on global warming. Uh, the earth is punishing us for punishing for us for punishing it for not recycling and things like that. I'm not knocking on recycling or keeping the earth clean, but that's what we hear all the time. Man is causing global warming and the, uh, the climate's going to change and it's going to destroy us. No, that's not what's going to happen. God 
is going to use the earth and the elements, even stuff from outer space, to destroy parts of the earth and some people that dwell on earth. Not global warming. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places and famines and pestilences and fear. Did I read that verse? I think I did. Uh, um, fearful such and great sign. Okay, I wanted to point out the fact that it says diverse places. Now, I thought this was interesting when I was comparing the sixth seal with this statement by Christ because in the sixth seal, we'll go back to Revelation 6 there. Remember it said there will be earthquakes in diverse places, in many places. That's what Christ said. But also we see here, it says, And the heaven depart as a scroll and is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Could that be the same thing as what Christ was saying, diverse places or many places? Or is this strictly saying that every single mountain and island were moved? I think it probably lines up with the diverse in many places, diverse places. Um, interesting when we see the, the connections here. Again, like I said, we're not doing it today, but we could go into Joel chapter 2 and 3, Isaiah chapter 13, uh, Haggai, Haggai, I think, and other places in the Old Testament where it talks about some of these same exact things, yet in the future, and there were types of them as well. Um, <clears throat> and like I said before, God has shaken this earth before. Genesis 1, verse uh, 1 and 2, there was the captable. We got a word study up on that. If you want to look that up, uh, type in our search bar on our website, captable. We got a whole word study on what that is. That, that means a great shaking, a casting down. So basically what we're seeing in the seals, trumps, and vials is another captable. A great shaking. You know, throughout history, uh, even in, amongst the pagans, they talk about times when whole civilizations were wiped out. They called them the, they called their civilizations that they had, their, their great pagan empires, and um, the glory days. They even talk about when other continents were above, other continents existed. You know, we talk about the, people talk about the lost continent of Atlantis and things like that. And I think, Mabiru, or maybe that's a planet or something like that. But um, anyways, there's been throughout, um, what do you want to call it, mythology, folklore, whatever, there's lots of writings of when ancient civilizations existed and then some catastrophe happened and wiped them out. We're just seeing a replay of that. We're seeing a replay of that. It's like God has given mankind a chance. And he's correcting and correcting and correcting the, the angels as well until, uh, until it's fi finally done. Verse 12, But before all these they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues. Uh, we should do our study, Synagogue of Satan, if you haven't uh, yet. And into prisons being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. What? The king, kings and rulers of what? The new world order. And what are we going there for? N not for ourselves, but for his sake. And you know what? Today we got, you know, people get involved in politics, and we should. Christians are supposed to be in every facet of life, trying to be that light and an example and change policy to fit, align with God's law, God's word. But what we have a lot of times is people get so involved in politics that they forget um, how we are to achieve liberty, how we are to achieve freedom. And they think, you know, a lot of people get in this, this liberty movement. I'm not saying it's a bad movement, but when you leave God out of the equation of it and you think that man should just rise up with his guns and demand freedom and liberty, hey, you're, you're not a losing battle. The whole reason you're losing your liberty it's because it's God's punishment. It's coming from the throne. We are losing our liberty and our freedom because we've ignored God. We've violated his laws. We've rejected his ways. And we've got crooked leaders and politicians in places of government that reflect, yeah, many times they reflect the people. 
So we're getting what we deserve. I just don't like to see people waste their entire amount, their entire life, energy, being vexed with anger. And believe me, we should have righteous indignation, and there's times to be angry. But when you waste your time fighting, using the wrong tools, wrong weapons for your battle, and in other words, what I'm trying to say is when you rely upon man and his wisdom rather than God, it's a losing battle you're fighting. You're wasting your time. You're not any better than a socialist liberal. Well, I shouldn't say you're not any better uh, because there's probably degrees there, but you're erring in, the same w in many of the same ways. When you trust in man over God, or you leave God out of the equation, it's a sin. I don't care if you're a conservative, a libertarian, or what not. It's a sin. All right. So anyways, what, what, this, what I'm talking about with this verse here is we're supposed to do things for God's kingdom. Advance his kingdom. And what did Christ say? He says, seek the kingdom. And all these things, seek, first, seek the kingdom. And all these things will be added to you. You'll have freedom. You'll have liberty. You'll have happiness. You'll have blessings. But if you try to do it a different way, you're not really much better than a thief or a robber. Verse 13, it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. I look forward to that time when the Holy Spirit speaks through me, as well as many others. I speak through us, is what I should be saying. I look forward to that time. He's going to use us just like he did Jeremiah, Ezekiel, when, the, when it said the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, or the Word of the Lord came unto them. And then they spoke God's words. Well, how awesome that's going to be. And you shall be betrayed by both parents. This is the saddest part of this whole thing. And this is the part that a lot of people have a hard time with. And you shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinfolks and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. That's not speaking figuratively. That's speaking literally. Put to death. That's where we're moving. That's where we're moving. We need to be prepared for that. Um, they're going to betray us. M many of you who study your Bible, your whole family thinks you're crazy anyways already. Just wait till we get further on down the line. This is like, uh, you know, world, one world government, sort of like world communism. Where your neighbors and your friends and your family will turn you in. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Now check that out. You, we will be hated, despised, rejected. Hey, you know what? I get a lot, you know, there's a, a lot of garbage put out on the internet about me. Why do you think that happens to people teaching the truth? It's like there's, there are some people out there that are like, they're possessed, consumed with endlessly making videos slandering and saying all kinds of nonsense about myself and other people? Why do you think that happens? Well, I like to think it's because we're doing something right. You know, there was an old preacher one time, I read about this in somewhere, and I can't remember his name, but um, it was back in the olden days, he was riding on his horse, going from place to place to teach, and he stopped, you know, and normally everywhere he goes, he was always getting some weird heckler, some demonic possessed person disrupting something, something. Somebody trying to stop him somewhere. And then all of a sudden he stopped and he realized when he was on his horse and he realized, hey, I haven't had any disturbances in a while. I haven't had any weird people saying weird things about me or anything crazy like that for a long time. And then he got off his horse. 
and fell on his knees and started repenting because he had realized, hey, I must, I must not be offending the devil. I must be doing something wrong. I must be making peace with him because he's not mad at me enough to disturb me. And you know what, man? I tell you what, I smile. When I see people make garbage videos lying and slandering about me because it's just one more reward I have up in the kingdom. And, I've, and I, I don't mean any ill will towards those people, but God help them. God help them for they know not what they do. Because when judgment comes, it is going to be a very rude awakening for some people. Um... And many times those types of people that do that, they are paid disinformation agents where they come in and they try to, to, they try to stop groups as they're beginning, Bible, uh, true Bible teaching churches. They try to throw everything they can at them, you know, throw as much crap against the wall and hope it sticks. Um, all out of order, discombobulated, lie here, and then they, they try to weave this big story, and it's just a bunch of nonsense. But they do it to try to stop the truth from going forward. And do I spend a lot of time talking about it, or, or no? I don't. I don't. It does. I don't even uh, really pay much attention to it at all, because I know God is, and He'll sort it out. Anyways. That's the case. We will be hated of all men for his namesake. You know, when we, when we stand up and we say homosexuality is wrong, it's a sin. What do you think happens? People look at us, they hate us for it. How dare you say that? That's a hate crime. There we have it there. Well, Things that we teach are going to be called hate crimes. They look at, look at us who want to do what's right, want to follow God's word, want to be good, love our neighbor, and love God. They look, they look at us as though we are some hateful villains because they're, we're ruining their little sin party going on here. Anyways. We're talking about seals here, and now we're on a moral lesson here. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. Is this talking physically? No, we're talking, we're talking primarily spiritually here. Because he says, in your patience possess ye your souls. And we find out when you cross-reference this, Christ told, up, told them to take up their cross and follow him. So when it says not a hair on your head, it's, Christ isn't preaching some religion that says that um, you're not going to suffer. You're not going to sacrifice. Um, you know, I'm going to save your flesh. It's not about that. Like we talked about in our last study, you have to have the mentality that you're going to take up your cross. That means take up your altar and be crucified with Christ if that becomes necessary. That altar being, or that cross being the altar, the altar of sacrifice. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them that be in Judea, we're not going to talk a lot about these verses today. We'll get more into these as, as uh, we get through Revelation. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. In other words, the wrath is coming. He says this, For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, now check this out, and wrath upon this people. What are we talking about here? We're talking about physical distress and physical wrath upon the peoples of the world for worshiping the Antichrist, his world government, and for rejecting our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Does it mean that uh, woe unto those that are with child as far as uh, Christians? No, it's not talking about Christians. We will be protected. And we'll get into that in the seventh chapter of Revelation. In our I think that's our next study. 
Verse 24, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles or the nations be fulfilled. Now here, here's what we came here for. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations. What's this distress? It means just, you know, everything's uptight. There's problems. You know, talking economic, wars, you name it. Uh, riots. Maybe even race wars coming in the future to America. I mean, you look at all this illegal immigration that's happening. And it's, it's dividing our nation. And there, there will be some consequences for that with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Possibly even some uh, tsunamis. Men's hearts, verse 26, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now this seems exactly like what we read in the sixth seal. Men's hearts, that's what it's all about, men's hearts begin to fail them for fear. Because they're looking up and they're saying, what in the world is going on? The world is falling apart. Well, it literally will be at that time. Um, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. After all those events, after all the seals, trumpets, and vials, then the Son of Man comes with great power and glory. Now what a time it's going to be. And when these things begin to, begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads for your redemption. Draweth nigh. So the message is when we see these things in Revelation start happening, is to not be fearful like the world will be, but look up and with expectation that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's going to be fascinating. Verse 29 And he spake to them a parable Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, when they now shoot forth, you see. And know of your own selves that summer is nigh at hand. What I found, I found it kind of interesting that during the sixth seal, the stars fell from heaven to the earth like a fig tree casteth her untimely figs. It's interesting that Christ is now talking about this fig tree when he's talking about the last days. So um, we're not going to really explore that today, but just something for you to think about. Um, let's recap. Events of the sixth seal. Like I said before, the sixth seal likely begins the day of the Lord, which is the day of his wrath, the day of vengeance. There's a great earthquake. The sun darkened. The moon becomes blood, red. Stars fall to earth in the form of meteors, probably a meteor shower. Heaven rolled up like a scroll. Every mountain and island moved. Earthquakes. People on earth filled with fear and the great day of wrath has begun so hey i hope you enjoyed that study we're going to get in i can't wait till we get into the seventh seal actually uh i believe it's actually i, I can't mention the seventh seal the seventh chapter of revelation where we're going to kind of take a look at it. It almost seems as though the seventh chapter is a continuation of the opening of the sixth seal, though it's divided up by a chapter. And we'll get into that. But hey, do like what Christ said in Matthew uh, chapter 4 when he was tempted of the devil. He said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So see that you study it. Um, consume it, digest it, meditate upon it every single day. So that you can be a Christian overcomer. Christian Overcomers is brought to you by the tithes and offerings of our listeners. If you'd like to donate, you can do so by going to ChristianOvercomers.com. God bless you and thank you for your support.